Mansfield Park is the home of Hoyk Rugby Club, one of the most successful clubs in Scotland. This season the Greens celebrated their 150th anniversary and they went into the campaign as Scottish champions, something they want to repeat in this special season. And at this moment they're very much on course to achieve that under the captaincy of Sean Muir and head coach Matty Douglas. Undefeated at Mansfield Park for 50 months is some record which will probably never be, be beaten. Yeah, and I think you know there's been a number of players have been in that jersey since then. I was involved in 2019, and then COVID struck, and um, you know that kind of <coughs> home form was something that was stalled. And just after COVID, you know we were a young side, and, and look at the end of the day, we were you know looking to try and beat relegation with the you know the young team we had. I always knew that we had something in there, and the the home form was a massive part. Of it. If we won our home games, we felt that we could have a uh, a big chance and and you know doing as best as we can, and it just kind of snowballed for there. And you know every time we take the field at Mansfield, it's it's all about that win and and putting a a big performance in. So look, chuffed and chuffed with the season so far. We had a blip at Mar and probably was the best thing that happened to us. If if I'm honest, I think we've since then really kicked on and probably playing a little bit better than we did last season which is you know it's a cliche for me to say that but look we're in a great place and you know Christmas break is a is a good time to get a bit rest in the legs and, and look we'll crack on once we get into the new year. A few years ago a special evening was arranged by the club to try and do the impossible to pick a greatest Hoik team of all time. It was the brainwave of ex-president of Hoik, Rory Bannerman, and the evening was a great success, bringing together some of the legends of Hoik rugby and relatives of some of the greats from the past. It's been very difficult for the selectors during the course of the last six months or so to work out who was going to be in that team because we all know who was in our greatest ever team. And that's a greatest team from 140 years of history. We go back to 1888, when we had three, three men who went on the first ever British Isles touring team down to the Antipodes. There were two Burnett brothers and a Mr. Lane. And those were the, the forerunners of many international and Lions players, barbarians and caps, people who refereed for Scotland, who were presidents of the Scottish Rugby Union, have all come from this small border town the most enjoyment I got, I, th I think, was when we won the league and won all our games. And we beat uh, West of Scotland. Stuffed them. <laughs> <laughs> because they'd beaten us previously two, two years in a row. And it was most satisfying. We really took them apart that year. Well, as a boy who had Great legends to folly. We've already mentioned a lot of names. Willie Welsh, Jerry Foster, Doug Davis. They're just a few of the boys. And you followed these boys and that was their target. Well, Jim, what a night. It was. It was a good night. I didn't really know what to expect. And I didn't really know if I'd enjoy it. Uh, it's maybe not the hike style to celebrate like that. But I must admit, it was good. I enjoyed it. It was good to see so many of the boys you've not seen for a while. Uh, and talk about things, well, talk rugby really, and that's, that, that's what made it enjoyable. Well, you were certainly one of the first on the list, I think, everyone who entered the competition. Um, everybody put Jim Rennick down as the number 13, and it just shows you what people think of you. Well, I think uh, that's, that's up to the people that vote, but uh, I know Hike have produced plenty of good players, and uh, it's an honour and a privilege to, to, to have been picked, but there again, it's only someone's opinion. A lot of people's opinion there. Well, people can see <laughs> see, see the watch of everybody's opinion there. It's but it, it is a, a privilege and, and a pleasure. But it, it's as I said tonight when I was speaking that the main privilege was to put on the green jersey, no get into the best side ever. And I think anybody that's ever played for Roy could have that sort of passion and feeling. More memories now from Graham Hogg, brother of Scotland's 100-capped Stuart, who himself won Scotland's Sevens Honours. And he was involved in many great moments for Hoyk in the past. Well, let's go back now to 2009. It was the Jed <coughs> Forest Sevens, and uh, you were in the final against Watsonians. And it was really our first glimpse, I think. I mean, we'd seen, a, we'd seen Stuart, obviously, a play um, in a Hoyk YM jersey and then a Hoyk jersey. 
at the Berwick Sevens, but yep. he was in the team, the Hoyk team, the Greens, and you were playing alongside your brother. And the most amazing uh, performance uh, by the Hoyk team, but also that famous try where he dummied to nobody but fooled everybody, passed on to you, and you dived in with the most spectacular dive. Great yeah. memory. Yeah, no, it was a really good memory. The memory of the day was that, actually, it's quite funny, Stuart was, uh, he was pretty ill that day. Uh, looking back, he never played much leading up to the final. Now, bearing in mind, he'd only probably been in the squad maybe two weeks previous, and, uh, a 16-year-old boy, and we were basically having to sort of mother him through the, the day. Uh, to get to the final now, it was, it was obviously quite an important day because we were going for Kings of the Sevens alongside Watsonians at the time who beat Selkirk, I think it was, in the semi to make sure that they they had won. But yeah, that that try that, that always sort of gets shown and come back, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good moment to look back on. Uh, I'm not sure my stomach enjoyed it when I hit the floor after the dive, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, it was certainly worth it, uh, and it's something that we we always look back on pretty fondly that day. So yeah, we we're both obviously pretty young at the time. It's probably not until now that we look back on it and and obviously see it was pretty special to play. I think the majority of the games we played twelve and thirteen together, uh, and obviously get those sevens competitions. We won obviously Jed sevens the weeks previous. We won Langham sevens together, I think as well. Uh, so yeah, no, there were good times. And then a year later, 2010, you were back here with the team. You were going for three wins in a row, which hadn't been done for years and years and years. Early 20th century, I think it happened. And you were against Kelso in the final, and Kelso were pretty good that that year. There was a lot of needle. It was a very feisty game. I think you and Mikhail Hartley uh, stopped sending each other Christmas cards at the time. <laughs> he got a yellow, so whatever you did, it worked, and you went on to win. Great start, though. I mean, what are your memories for that? Because you went 14 nil up, and then they tagged you back. Yeah, as you say, Kelso were a really good seven uh, at the time. Uh, they, I think they, we always had really good contests with them, like we did with everybody. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure from, from memory, I wouldn't have said anything at all to them. Uh, <laughs> As I say, memory-wise, I cannot remember what happened, but it was obviously a bit of a turning point in the game. I think they basically, he'd gave a two-on-one, he'd broke through, gave a two-on-one and put somebody away to score, which would have probably taken it back. They would have went back in front, I think, if I'm right with saying. Yeah, so, yeah, whatever I said, if anything, it certainly worked. <laughs> <laughs> but it's part of the game, isn't it? I mean, we know you, you can go around every club and there's what we call the yellow card man. It's uh, it's like Neil Darling back in the Selkirk days, Graham Dodds, Melrose, Bruce McNeil, a hoik, you know, who've got the, the yellow card kind of pinned to them. Um, it's part of the game. It's all about winding up the opposition and uh, to get someone else off the pitch for seven minutes or so. Yeah, did Bruce McNeil get many yellow cards? Uh, a couple, apparently, yeah, and then was the odd it? red one, apparently, as well. <laughs> I wasn't sure he had many, but yeah, that, that was just, that you mentioned characters there, Dudzy, Duro, boys like that, that you know you knew what you were getting playing against these guys. They were excellent sevens players, especially. Uh, really hard men uh, when they were playing, but yeah, we definitely had, as you say, have your yellow card boys, but you have your boys who, who know how to, to wind boys up as well. So, no, they were great fun. Yeah, it was, it was great playing against these guys yeah, for many years back then. But back to the Hoyk Sevens final that year, 2010 against Kelso, 14 nil up you were, and you were having a blinder. Everything that you seemed to do, um, you know, turned to gold. And um, there was that time, of course, that great pass uh, that you, you you put out to Neil Rennick, uh, for Neil Rennick to, to get the score, which I think drew you level. And then, of course, Rennick went on and scored the, the final try, which clinched it all. Yeah, I think that's when Neil really came to the fore, sevens-wise. Yeah, I was probably getting a little bit long in the tooth by then, uh, and he definitely had a lot more gas than, than what the majority of us used to have, especially me. So if I remember correctly, sort of feet-wise and, and pace, I think he went basically the length for one of the tries. Yeah, it was an excellent score. And we interviewed you after well, at the time, and uh, you were well chuffed. So was the whole team. So was the club. Yeah, obviously, I think you say it was the third year on the bounce. We'd won it now. Before that, I think we'd been in maybe three finals. Before that, that we'd got beat in the final. I know Newcastle the year before we started winning here. So it was obviously good to... to you have to enjoy these times. And it was good to get on a roll. I think they went on in the end to maybe, was it five or six yeah. on the bounce? Yeah, that Michael Robertson, that Jungle keeps telling me about, that he's got the full six, so which is an incredible achievement. Yeah, but no, it's it'd, it'd be rude not to enjoy those times. What's your favourite Hoik memory, just to end with? 
Sevens wise? Sevens and fifteens, whatever. Uh, probably two that stand out. Probably the first one, the first Hoik Sevens that I won, uh, which we played Selkirk in the final here to the year before. I think the one we were talking about that obviously stands out because the year, the year the first won it, I was out uh, through injury, so I never I never played in that one. Uh, and then fifteens wise would be the playoff game against Dundee. Oh yeah, uh, I think that that was my last ever game for Hoyk uh, before I before I went abroad, uh, and that was a game that will certainly live long in the memory. Uh, it was one of them. I think it was something. Ridiculous! I think Dundee got maybe three or four penalty tries three from penalty scrums. Tries. One that we we often put back up again for people to to see to uh, refresh their memory. But it was some day, and I mean they had a huge pack. Uh, Alan Brown, I think, was uh, one of the try scorers and uh, performed incredibly well. You know, you got the tries that that uh, that mattered. The team spirit and stuff that that always comes out with with boys who play down here. Yeah, just sort of showed, and I think the crowd up there that day was was outstanding. Yeah, some atmosphere. Yeah, I've never seen sort of Boroughmuir packed out like that before. So no, it was it was great to play in front of. Yeah, and it was obviously great to get the win in the end as well. And finally, I must just ask you about something that happened in the far corner. Um, again, you were involved because you gave the scoring pass to Lee Armstrong, and that was a game against Glasgow Hawks featuring Michael Adamson, who's now a top referee, of course, uh, but he was uh, a bit anti-referee at that particular moment, I think. <laughs> and that was some game, wasn't it? Because it was 6-6. Six, six. It was all about getting the result to get promotion back into the top flight to the Premiership. And it was something like two minutes into injury time, the ball came back the Hoyk way, you got the ball, and it was a long, accurate pass to Lee Armstrong, and he did the rest. Wow. Yeah, no, it was. I completely forgot about that game, to be perfectly honest with you, until I How seen it. How can you forget about that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the memory's not as good as what it used to be. <laughs> uh, until I seen it, obviously, the, the other night on social media, and... I think looking at conditions and stuff there and how tight my top was that day, I'd obviously <laughs> came off the bench and the, towards the end my sort of passing game was definitely a, a forte of mine. So especially when you had boys like Lee Armstrong who, who could beat anybody in a phone box. Uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a great try in the end. And as you say, I played a bit of sevens with Mikey uh, and I've been winding him up this week since I've seen it. I sent him the footage of, of him having a go at the ref, which is, uh, which is a little bit funny now considering he is where he is. Murray Watson has been involved in the club for many years and has been running the successful Hoyk Memories Club, which does so much to ensure that the rich history of the Greens is not forgotten. And along with President Ian Landles, he co-edited the book to commemorate the 150th anniversary. The book is essentially about rugby, about what has made Hoyk such a consistently successful club, but it's more than that. It's about a community, it's about a town, it's about people, it's about friendship, it's about passion. Uh, the way people feel about rugby, the way they feel about uh, human life and the way that they feel about uh, Hoyk, the town and the rugby club. And where do you begin on a project like this? Well, we, uh, we decided that we wanted to interview people, then along came the pandemic. Uh, and rather than let that defeat us, it was actually uh, a benefit because we were able to use Zoom technology to conduct oral history interviews uh, with people anywhere in the world. And we interviewed people like Colin Deans in Northamptonshire, uh, Craig Dunlee in New Zealand, Rob Naylor in Canada. Uh, so we were able to get access to people that we probably wouldn't have done if it hadn't been for the pandemic. But the topics that they talked about you know, we could not fail because it was a, a fascinating range of different stories uh, about the pitch, uh, 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 about preparing for the rugby, about volunteering, about going away, supporting the club. Uh, um, we go back quite a long way because we've actually managed to find a report, a contemporary report written of the very first rugby match that Hoyk ever played in. Uh, so we have covered the whole 150 years in the book. The club is certainly in a good place right now as the Scottish Premiership and Scottish Cup title holders march on in their bid to become back-to-back -back double champions in their special year.